The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So I uh, have the pleasure to introduce Richard Murray, professor uh, here, received his BS degree from Caltech in 1985, an MS and PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley in 1988 and 1991, respectively. He is currently the Thomas Ian e. Doris Everhart Professor of Control and Dynamics and Bioengineering here at Caltech. Um, his research is in the application of feedback and control in network systems with application in autonomy and biology. Current projects include verification and validation of distributed embedded systems, analysis of insect flight control systems, and biological circuits. Richard. Great. Thanks, Thanks Len. <laughs> OK, so I want to say a little bit about control theory and methods today. And what I'll try to do is give you an overview of some of the key principles and concepts and a little bit of some of the tools that get used uh, in this particular field. Uh, and I'll talk both about classical control theory, which is sort of the roots uh, of the discipline uh, and guides a lot of uh, the approaches that we use, uh, but also about uh, more recent things, looking at optimization-based control that uh, are sort of um, enabled by modern computation and fit very nicely with the sorts of things that we see, for example, in spacecraft. Uh, and then also say a little bit at the end about, you know, kind of where is the field heading and what are the sorts of problems and things that relate uh, to some of my research and some of the things that we've done over the years with uh, JPL. OK, so let me start by just sort of saying, what is control theory? Um, and sort of the traditional view of control theory uh, is that it's the use of feedback uh, for stability, performance, and robustness. And so you can think about uh, if you have something like a vehicle of some sort and you want to regulate its speed, like the cruise control probably on most of the cars you guys drive, um, then what you might do is sense the current speed, compare that to the speed you'd like to be going, 65 miles an hour, whatever it is, uh, and then compute what should I do if I'm going too slow or too fast? How much should I push the gas pedal or whatever it is? Uh, and then take that computation uh, and actually implement it. And so uh, press the gas harder uh, and make the car go faster. And then as you start go faster, pull off on the gas and all of those things. So that's kind of the classical uh, feedback control loop. Uh, and so it involves sensing actuation and computation in some sort uh, of an interconnected cycle. Uh, and the study of that is where control theory started. Um, I usually like to remind people that when they're thinking about uh, control theory, they should think about Duff, like Duff beer, if you keep track of The Simpsons. Uh, that is, the key things to uh, keep in mind are dynamics, uncertainty, feedback, and feed forward. So another way of thinking about control theory is that it's the study of uh, dynamics, uncertainty, feedback, and feed forward uh, in complex systems. So traditionally, uh, you might look at a system like that, and we still do. Um, but as we start looking at more, and, and the sorts of things that people have looked at, thermostats and flight control systems, et cetera, fit within this kind of a paradigm. But the sorts of things that are people are looking at more recently are a little bit more complicated. So we might be looking at Mars rovers, or the internet, or your complex battlefield management systems if you're DARPA. And so now we think of control theory more as a set of tools and techniques for analyzing, designing, and implementing complex systems. And this is consistent with what Bob told us uh, a little bit earlier uh, in thinking about systems engineering. So it's the combination of dynamics and interconnection, feedback and feedforward, but also now communications, computing, and software. So all of that, I think, is things that people in the field of control theory and other fields think about. Uh, and really, one of the key things that's happened over the last decade or so is the understanding that uh, really successful implementation of complex feedback control systems required both thinking about the control theory and the traditional view that I just talked to you about, but also uh, looking at a computer science point of view. <coughs> and some of the key principles that underlie both the traditional and the emerging view are that feedback provides a tool for managing uncertainty. That is, if you have uncertainty, but someplace you can sense something about your system and reason about what you should do, you can manage that uncertainty. So I can manage the uncertainty about uh, whether or not uh, your engine has slightly less power, more power as a function of the temperature outside uh, simply by putting a feedback loop and increasing the speed so that you still go the right speed uh, in your cruise control system. Another thing that feedback is used for is to design the dynamics of a system. So you might take a system that, say, nominally is unstable, like this forward swept wing aircraft, and redesign using feedback the dynamics so that you get nice flight qualities, for example. And another principle that comes up a lot is that uh, feedback and control are very useful for doing uh, modularity, for managing modularity. So if you have components and subsystems and you want to make those components and subsystems behave in a manner that is 
independent of what's connected upstream or downstream of them. Feedback is one of the mechanisms that you can use uh, to try and implement such modularity. So it comes up very much in the types of things that we've heard about uh, earlier in the day. Uh, and if I had to sort of pick a phrase uh, for doing this, I might use a phrase like this. So control theory is the principles of the methods used to design engineering systems that maintain desirable performance by automatically adapting to changes in the environment. And so you can see why this might be relevant for resilience, right? Because this is not too different, right, from the sorts of things that we talked about uh, this morning. Okay, so this is kind of you know, what I would define the field to be about, and lots of other people may have things they want to add. There are a couple of important trends uh, in the last decade or so that are shaping uh, the field. Uh, and so one of those is the use of online optimization-based control. So this is a flight control system uh, that we used to have uh, in my lab over in Steel Building. And this is a ducted fan aircraft flying around. But what's interesting about this is that what the system is actually doing is continuously recomputing a trajectory for the next couple of seconds of flight about every tenth of a second, and then implementing that over and over and over again. So this isn't something where we've pre-computed a feedback control law, but we're actually computing right, open loop control laws over and over and over. So we're sort of doing online computation of what I should do. Uh, and this allows us in ways that I'll show you as we go later to take into account constraints and failures of sensors and actuators in interesting ways, because essentially we're recomputing based on some model. And if something changes, we can update that model and redo that computation online with that. And this is happening all over the place. Uh, you may, if you've heard about this, you may hear about it as model predictive control or receding rising control. These are the terms that are often used in the field. Um, and the idea is that if we have some knowledge of our current constraints in the environment, uh, we can use that to get both performance and adaptability uh, to changes in those things. Um, another thing that's going on, and again, uh, already got mentioned, is the, is the role of layering and architectures uh, in thinking about control. And so how do you do uh, command and control at different layers of abstraction? Uh, and how do you implement the connections between those layers of abstraction? And how do you think about modularity uh, across product families so that people can change things in different layers and you don't have to worry about changing things at higher layers or lower layers? Um, formal methods uh, for analysis and design. So this is a protocol that's running that's trying to uh, block incoming robots. Uh, and that protocol, uh, we specify the desired behavior uh, in a way that makes use of uh, formal uh, methods from computer science and then try and synthesize control laws that satisfy those formal specifications. Uh, and so how do we combine some of the things you might think of as a protocol as something for computer science, but this is a very dynamic situation with motion and feedback and other things. So how do we combine those ideas uh, and really think about uh, doing this in a formal way? Um, and then the last trend that I'll put up here is just the notion that we're going from control of components, that in some sense the cruise control system, the speed controller is a kind of component level thing in a car, to thinking about systems, so I want to control the entire aircraft and I want to manage all of the power flow and hydraulic pressures and air flows in that aircraft, to thinking about the entire enterprise. So I'd like to manage the entire US airspace uh, as an entity. Right? And so as we think about control going up from components to systems to enterprise, we go from inner loops to outer loops to entire enterprise-wide uh, control systems. And of course, uh, the integration of software with controls becomes even more important here. OK, so at a high level, that's sort of what control theory is about and some of the directions uh, that people are heading. Let me now you know, sort of back up and I'll start back in traditional control and just you know, some of the key concepts that underlie the worldview of people in control theory and so bias us in certain ways. Uh, for good or for bad, uh, that uh, sort of underlie this. And then I'll kind of come back to some of these uh, sort of more future directions. OK, so for the most part, I'm not going to put up lots of math and formulas and other things, but because uh, it's inevitable that some of those will creep in, just a little bit of terminology. One of the things that we do often is we look at input-output systems. And so we look at some system uh, described here by some set of linear differential equations. We have some input to that system, U. We have some output from that system, Y. Y is a measurable output, or it's what interconnects to the next system, depending on its use. Um, and we can represent systems in different ways. So this might be a nonlinear differential equation that describes this, or it might be a finite state automata or other things. But in traditional control theory, typically this is a linear input-output uh, system written here in state space form. So you should think of x as a vector of states. It might be the position and velocities of a vehicle, for example. Um, Ax somehow represents the internal evolution of that with no input applied. Bu represents if I apply a force someplace, how does that change the state? Uh, and then I measure something. Measure, maybe it's positions and velocities, but I only measure the xy position. Uh, and from that, uh, I want to determine uh, something else about the system or control it. And one of the very common things that we do is that we, when we look at input-output responses, we will look at the response of systems to sinusoids at different frequencies, so the frequency response of the system. So if we pick a particular input uh, where we look at a sinusoid coming in, uh, and then we look at the output after the transients have died out, 
uh, then that output will also be a sinusoid for a linear system at the same frequency, omega t, but with a potentially different amplitude and a potentially different phase. And so the amplitude and phase of this system is the frequency response. It's a frequency-dependent amplitude and phase. That is, that the amplitude, the gain of the system, the amount that I uh, modify this amplitude may change as a function of the frequency. And so we can talk about the frequency response. So this shows the gain of the system and the phase change as a function of frequency. Uh, and it's usually plotted in what's called a Bode plot. So if you hear me say Bode plot, this is what I mean, where we look at frequency in a log, on a log scale. We look at the magnitude on a log scale. And this says that you have a gain of 1 at low frequencies. So if I put a sinusoid in, I'll get a sinusoid out at the same amplitude. Um, and then that, amp that goes up a little bit, maybe to 5 or something like that. So here's a resonance where I put in something at amplitude 1 and it resonates more. Um, and then it dies down at higher frequencies. And similarly, if I look at the phase of that, I see that it's in phase at low frequencies and then eventually goes to 180 degrees out of phase. So it will go out of phase with whatever my input signal is. And so this frequency response, or Bode plot, uh, helps describe the system. Um, the frequency response uh, corresponds to looking at uh, the Laplace transform of the system, if you know about Laplace transforms. Or you can just think of this as I can write down, it turns out, this frequency response in this way, which is that g of s is a transfer function that I can compute from my original system description. And if I replace s with i omega, and think of this as a complex function, and I look at the magnitude and phase of that complex function as a function of omega, that's exactly what I'm plotting over here. And so this is another representation of the frequency response computed from the dynamics of the system. And what's handy uh, about uh, transfer functions in particular is that we can compose them in different ways. And so for example, if I have two systems in series, uh, one system takes u1 as its input and produces y1 as its output. It looks like this. And then I have another system output after it that takes u2 as its input and gives me y2 as its output. I can actually get the transfer function for the series composition simply by multiplying the transfer functions. And in particular, if my transfer function is represented as a polynomial uh, n, the numerator, over the denominator, then I just multiply the numerators and the denominators. And so transfer functions allow us to do what we often call block diagram algebra. Just by multiplying polynomials corresponding to what's in the blocks, I can reason about uh, the system. And so for example, if I have uh, two transfer functions in parallel, then I can also write down what the transfer function is for this composition, a parallel composition. And maybe most importantly, since we're going to do feedback, if I have the transfer functions for two systems in feedback form, I can also write down the transfer function for the overall system. So for example, I showed you that the classical uh, system might be something where we uh, have a system when we measure uh, the, uh, so think of this as a combination of sensing, computation, and actuation all lumped together coming back. And I want to know how does my closed loop system behave. This might be a way of doing that. So th that's the only technical material you need to understand what I'm going to tell you today, is the notion that we have uh, input-output systems. We can represent those by the transfer function, which is equivalent to looking at the frequency response. And part of the reason that we do this is it allows, in this kind of traditional control system setting, easy descriptions of different compositions that come up as we build these complex systems. All right. So given that, you can now say, well, all right, so what are some of the design patterns? So Bob mentioned design patterns that people in control use. And I'm going to give you two of them. The top one is a design pattern that you've already seen part of. Uh, that is that we have some process. Think of this as the automobile. Um, we uh, take the output of that process. We compare it to some input. Uh, that generates an error. This might be the difference in speed that you're trying to go. Uh, and that error then goes through a controller, which modifies the input, right? So in some sense, if the output of this was the speed, and then I subtract the speed from the desired speed, and then I compute how much do I want to press the gas pedal as a function of that error in the desired speed, and then that goes to the car, and that causes the speed to change, right? And so I go around this loop over and over again. That's exactly that sort of feedback control system. Now, what's extra in this are a couple of things that are important. So one is that. Often, we shape the input. So I have a reference speed that I'd like to go. And instead of saying, OK, you're going 55 miles an hour, now go 65 miles an hour, and suddenly the car's got a 10 mile an hour difference and it's going to floor it, right? you might say, look, I want you to ramp up right, over 10 seconds from 55 to 65. So I want to shape that input. So I get the command. right? You sort of say, hey, go 65. Now you hit resume right, on your cruise controller or something like that. You don't want to immediately right, just sort of floor it so you get 65. You want to ramp that up slowly. So that's a notion of a feed-forward compensation, or a reference shaping, it's sometimes called. Um, and that actually generates the actual signal that I try and track. So that's one thing that's different here. Um, another thing is that we really care about the fact that the system that we're looking at may have disturbances that come in. So for example, I may be driving in a wind, or I may be going up a hill, and that affects what's going on. 
And when I measure the output, I may have noise. So my speedometer measurement may not be perfect. And so I care about disturbances that come in. I care about noise that comes in. I care about my references that come in. And so I want to somehow design with some knowledge of what these disturbances or noise are. Because of course, if I have noise on my sensor, right, and my sensor is telling me you're going 55, no 54, no 56, right, it's going back and forth, I don't want to be jamming the gas back and forth. Chances are it's just sensor noise, right? So my, you know, it's like your speedometer's wiggling a little bit, right, because you've got, you know, some sort of friction in your, uh, if you have an old car that has a speedometer that's connected up mechanically, right? Um, but, you know, that's not really what's going on. You average that out. You say, oh, it's okay, I'll average it out, right? So you want to do that too. And so we need to know something about the disturbances and the noise. Um, the other thing that can happen, I'll get more explicit about it in a little bit, is that this P of S may not be exactly known, right? I mean, I can get in and drive Mitch's car and probably hold reference speed, even though I don't even know what kind of car he drives, right? And I don't know whether or not, you know, he's got his kids bundled up in the back, right? And, you know, tied in the trunk, you know, because he's really tired of hearing them, whatever, right? I don't know any of that. I can still drive the car, even though it's uncertain dynamics, right? And so um, we want to take that into account somehow. Okay, so this is one design pattern that's a very classical one, um, where we do reference shaping, we have a control law, we have disturbances and noise. Another one that's a little bit more complicated, but very relevant for some of the things that are more modern, uh, is something where same basic structure, but with a little bit difference in the way that we think about it. Here what we do is that we imagine having state feedback. And so what do I mean by state feedback? Remember this process was something that I wrote down as x dot equals ax plus bu, so I had some state x, some vector of state. And Perhaps what I want to do is I want to think about, I have some reference that I'd like to follow, and if I have a model of my system, I can generate a desired state trajectory and nominal input that I know satisfy the dynamics of that system. So think of XD uh, and UFF as something that, if the system were exactly like my model, right, this UFF applied to the system would cause it to follow a state trajectory that would give me exactly my reference. So it's like an inverse model. And now what I want to do is, I want to say, okay, well, here's the desired state. Um, I have some output which may not be in my entire state. Maybe it's a flight control system or an aircraft or something. I know it's position, but the full state's the position and the velocity and the attitude. And so just from the position, right, I might need to infer what those are. And so an observer is a formal device that does that. That is, we look at the outputs of the system, and from looking at the inputs to the system and the outputs to the system, we can reason about what the underlying state should be. And so this is x hat, and the hat is there to tell us it's an estimate of the state. It may not be perfect. But now if I have an estimate of the state and I know what my desired state is, I can form a state error, right? That is not just what's the error in the outputs, but what's the error in each of the individual states. And then I can use a state feedback, that is that I say, well, I've got a little bit of error in position, but also in orientation and also in velocity. And so I need to somehow combine those errors, right, to give me the right input to apply. And so that's the state feedback term. And when we do that, we get some input here, UFB for the feedback portion, that we can combine with UFF, the feed forward person, portion, to drive my process. Now, if my process model here is perfect, it's exactly the one that I use for this trajectory generation. In fact, just applying this UFF will generate exactly the input that generates the output that gives me exactly the right state, and I'll have zero error, and I won't need to do anything. But we know that we have disturbances and noise, Right? We don't know what those disturbances are necessarily. That is, our trajectory generation may not be able to sense the wind around us, or it may not be able to sense whether I'm on a hill, maybe. Um, or it may not be able to sense whether or not I've got something in the back, or how full my gas tank is, things that affect the dynamics. And so we don't expect that this feed forward will exactly generate the right inputs. Uh, and so we correct for that. So if there's some error between what I expected to happen and what actually happens, I modulate my input a little bit. And so this notion of having uh, trajectory generation, an observer, and state feedback is another design pattern. It's sort of, you know, you, you can see all the blocks line up, right? So you can think of this as just a special case of this, but it's one where we've added on some description of what we want those blocks to be. That is, that the feed forward block, in some sense, right, is actual trajectory generation. I don't just do error feedback, I do state feedback, right? And so things like that. We can also, sometimes take into account what we know about the environment in the trajectory generation. So I may want to, knowing that I'm coming up on a hill, if I happen to know that, I could you know, sort of prepare for that. Um, another thing, and again, I'll show you this more later, is that sometime we actually let the trajectory generation depend on the current state. Uh, and so I'll say a little bit more about this, but these ideas of online optimization uh, often make use of this. Okay, so those are two design patterns that we often see. Uh, in these control systems, and at least for the next 20 minutes or so, I'll mainly talk about this design pattern and the things that go along with it, and then I'll kind of flip to this design pattern uh, and some of the things that go along with that. Okay, so 
Just simple example, just to make sure we're all kind of on the same page. So here's the cruise control system. Uh, here's this design pattern. I'm not looking at noise in this case, but I've got disturbances. I've got some reference input. There's no feed forward or input shaping on this particular one. Right? It's a special case, so f of s is equal to 1, that feed forward block that was up here. Um, and now I might say, OK, good. How would I design the controller in order to uh, maintain a constant speed? And so we could write down a model. So for example, we might write down f equals ma in a very simplified form. So if v is the velocity of the car, then its acceleration is v dot. Uh, and m times v is ma. And that should be equal to the forces that are being applied to the car. Uh, and those forces might be some sort of friction or wind resistance or rolling resistance, whatever you want. And here I've taken that to be linear. Um, some torque that comes in from the engine. And here I've simplified that and assumed that you're going to command directly the sort of force on the car from the engine and not worry about the transmission and the gear. But you could do all of that. Um, and I might have some disturbance here that comes from going up a hill, for example. Right? If I go up a hill at different angles, that generates some force according to gravity right? in the projection of that uh, onto uh, the direction of travel. And so this might be my description of P of S up here. And you see that U engine and D hill, that's the sum of these two things, right? And so this is just a simple system. I could write down its transfer function, for example. Um, and now I need a control law. And the control law is going to take the output minus the reference and act on it. So my output here is going to be the velocity V. My reference is going to be the desired velocity, 55 miles an hour or whatever it is. And here I'm going to use a very simple control law, just proportional feedback. That is, that it's proportional to the error between the reference and the output. Right? So the simplest thing we could imagine. And this gives me my U engine, which is this U that's sitting right here. Right? So that's a very simple control system. And it's a linear differential equation. And we can all write down its solutions. But we can see already uh, from this some of the properties. So if you write down the solutions, you might ask, for example, well, if I give you a step change in input, what does the response of the system look like? And so if, if you were going some speed, and I suddenly tell you to go at a different speed, here would be a typical response. Right? So in some period of time, five seconds, two seconds, depending on how aggressive you want to be. Uh, I want to go from my old speed to something close to my new speed. And this particular control law will always require some error. Why? Because if there's no error whatsoever, right, then this will be 0. If the engine force is 0, I'll slow down. right? And so I have to have some error to sort of drive that nominal amount of input. How much error depends on the size of this gain k. right? If I have a very big k, a difference of 0.1 miles an hour might generate enough force to keep me going 55 miles an hour. If I have a very small k, right, then I might have to have a 10 mile an hour difference in order to generate that same amount of input. Now, if you look at the steady state uh, of this, what you see in the steady state is you can actually just solve this out. Sorry, this should have been d hill. And this is what uh, that looks like. That is, the steady state speed <clears throat> depends on the parameters in here, the damping of the system and the amount of gain that I use in this very simplified example. <coughs> and in particular, if there's no hill, right, this will be k over b plus k. So if k is small, you'll have a fairly large difference. right? It'll be close to 0, for example. Um, if k is very large, right, then this goes close to 1, and you get closer and closer. Right? And so you see that k can affect that. Um, and then the effect of the hill also comes through through this dk. So what are the types of questions that we might like to ask? Well, we might want to ask, for example, a specify, let's say, something about stability and performance. So we might say the steady state velocity should approach the desired velocity. Um, and uh, it does. And in fact, as k approaches infinity, it approaches uh, perfectly. We might also want, so that's a steady state property. We might also want to say that I've got smooth response, right? that you very smoothly go up. You don't overshoot, go too fast, and then slow back down, things like that. So those are typical specifications. Um, we care about disturbance rejection. And notice here that, again, in this disturbance rejection, if k is very large, this term goes to 0. Right? And so the effect of a hill, right? if you're going to go up a 10% grade or something like that, right? that's some amount of force. Uh, and that amount of force, its effect on your steady state velocity goes down as k gets big. So we see that high gain right, helps in this case. So disturbance rejection is another property that we might do. I'd like to, you know, if the wind's blowing me around on the runway, I'd like to stay within a half meter of the center line of the runway would be another one that's like that. Um, and finally, we can talk about robustness. Um, and here, the way to see robustness is that notice that if k is big enough, it doesn't actually matter what b is. And m didn't appear anywhere. Right? So in fact, I don't care what the mass of the car is. That doesn't enter into at least this part of the spec, the steady state part of the spec. And furthermore, if k is a million and b is anything between 1 and 10,000, right, it's negligible. Right? It's a factor of 100 or more less than anything that I care about. And so it doesn't really matter. Right? And of course, a friction that's between 1 and 10,000, that's a lot of difference in friction. Right? But my controller doesn't care if I use high gain. Right? And so we get robustness of the performance at high gain, independent of what the parameters are, with some potential trade-offs that I'll tell you about later. Right? I mean, obviously, if the gain is really high, you're going to be really twitchy. Right? So for example, if I put noise in here, 
right? A small amount of noise on my speedometer, I'd constantly be reacting, right? Oh, you're a uh, hundredth of a mile an hour off, so I'll just floor it, right? You know, something like that, if, I, if k was a billion, right? Uh, and so you don't want to do that. Okay, so that's kind of the basic idea of sort of feedback and control and the sorts of performance and uh, robustness specifications that we look at, and at least in a very simple example, an idea of how you can use feedback to manage uncertainty. If you don't know what B is, right, then use a large gain and it won't matter, right? So we're managing the uncertainty and the knowledge of the friction coefficient by putting in a feedback loop that's measuring the actual speed and correcting for it. Um, and there's also a design of dynamics aspect in terms of shaping what you want this response to look like that I haven't talked about. Um, and in this case, the modularity part doesn't really enter because it's too simple of a system. Okay, so given that, you're now all quasi-experts in uh, some parts of control theory, at least the basic concepts. You know, what are the types of tools that the field brings? So, you know, for the first 50, 60 years or so, so let's say up to a decade ago, uh, lots of work and lots of tools that people have developed, and you know, these get used all the time, of course. So there's a lot of work on modeling, input-output representations for subsystems, how to interconnect them. I showed you the transfer function rules. How do you identify the system dynamics, right, from measurements and other things? Uh, what are the theory and algorithms for reduced order modeling? So if I have a very complicated system, that may be too complicated for me to use in my computational tools, so how do I develop a simplified model that I can manipulate more easily? Um, there's lots of work looking at how to analyze feedback systems. I'll talk a little bit more about these and talk about stability margins, for example. This is a robustness measure. Um, and to talk about uh, performance of those systems. So I mentioned disturbance rejection, step responses, overall robustness. Um, and one of the great things about control theory is it provides uh, explicit synthesis tools. Uh, that is, if I give you a model of the system and I give you some performance specification, we can synthesize the feedback control law that satisfies those performance specifications and robustness and stability specifications according to that model, right? And I mean, literally, you go in MATLAB and you put those things in uh, and you say synthesize and it gives you back the control law, right? So I mean, it really is a very explicit synthesis procedure. So for the most part, what we don't do in feedback control systems is manually design what the feedback control system is in some sense, uh, and then check, verify that it's okay, right? You actually synthesize correct uh, control laws uh, as frequently, and we tend to do that more and more. Okay, so there are constructive tools for doing all of these things. Okay, so that's the basic feedback loop that I want you to remember, and here, you know, if you go back and look at these uh, charts uh, online when they get posted, uh, those are the terms that I've defined. Okay, so just one more example of a type of control law uh, that's very common and so worth pointing out here. The kind of the canonical feedback example and used, I don't know, 90% of all control systems probably come down to this, or at least simple control systems, uh, is PID control. So PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative Control. Uh, and the idea is, same design pattern, but now what I'm going to tell you is what this controller is going to look like. So I have to tell you what U is as a function of the error. And it's going to be of this form. Right? U of T is going to have a proportional term. You already saw that one in the cruise control example. Um, but it's going to have two other terms. One is it's going to have this integral term. Uh, and then the third term is going to be uh, this derivative term. Uh, and the idea of the integral term is that this makes sure that I will not have a steady state error. Right? So remember before, I said, well, I've got some gap between my desired and my actual. Well, how might you fix that? We said, well, if I've got some gap, then I want to integrate that error, and as I integrate that error, this term's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until that gap goes to zero. If the system is stable, then, in fact, this control law will guarantee that you have zero error in steady state, right? Absent disturbances and other things, right? Because if it was anything other than zero, it would be some fixed number, and that fixed number integrated forever would give you infinity, so you can't have that, right? The system would blow. So if it's stable, you will have zero error, absent disturbances and noise. Um, so that's the role of this integral term, and it's very common. People think about it as resetting the bias. This is where, depending on what Mitch's car is and other things, the integral term would sort of pick up, is it a heavier car, for example, right? So that's a bias term that I have to apply. Um, the derivative term is a sort of anticipatory term. That is that if I know that my error is changing, um, I don't, you know, I may be going through zero error. I know that my error is decreasing, and before it goes through zero and I overshoot, I want to start compensating for that, right? So you can think of that as looking at the sign of the derivative of the error, I might want to start to tune my input. So this is called an anticipatory term. 
And so one way to think about PID is that if you're sort of sitting at some uh, point in your error at a function of time, the proportional term is going to be proportional to the height of this, the integral term is going to be proportional to the past history of this error, and the derivative is going to be proportional to the current derivative of this. And so you see that here you might want to start slowing down because uh, you're maybe heading toward that peak or something like that. It will actually be, as you come down here, you would sort of see that uh, you start to slow down, and so you may want to address that. Okay, so this is a very kind of classical uh, structure, three-term controller it was originally called. Um, and these three pieces sort of matter. And again, there are systematic techniques for designing all of these. And to think about the stability of this, the performance of this, right? So we want to track the reference, avoid overshoot, et cetera, and the robustness. So we'd like these properties to hold in the presence of uncertainty in the, in the disturbances. We don't know what they are exactly. Maybe uncertainties in the performance. Now, one of the things I've glossed over, and you sort of heard me say it in the context of integral feedback, is stability, if the system is stable, right? And so stability is one of the challenges of feedback control, that is that when I connect the output back to the input, I run the risk that the system might go unstable, right? And so if I had the little gain knob for the microphone, I'd painfully make us all aware of that by turning the gain up and listening to it hum, right? Uh, and that would be an example of an instability, right? It's amplifying my own voice too many times, it gets big, right, and it sort of goes unstable. So we have to watch out for that. And so one of the very useful uh, tools for doing that, that kind of gives some insight into uh, how you think about uh, these properties is the Nyquist criterion. Um, and let me describe the criterion first and then I'll sort of tell you how to think about it. So the idea is if I want to look at a closed loop system and see if it's stable, uh, something I can do is I can look at what's called the loop transfer function, which is just the product of the controller transfer function and the process transfer function. Remember, these can be computed from the state space representation. Um, and some results in uh, complex control, uh, complex control, in uh, complex systems, complex uh, functions, uh, tell us that if we trace out the value of this loop transfer function uh, around uh, what's called the decontour, so we basically move up the uh, imaginary axis and then go around a big circle, kind of out at, at infinity, uh, that if we plot the transfer function as we go around this curve, then we get some closed curve, right? This is a complex function. I'm evaluating on some set of arguments. And if I plot that transfer function, I might start here at omega equals zero, go up in positive frequency and come back around here. Most transfer functions go to zero as the frequency gets very large, so that's why it's going to zero. Uh, and then I'm at this very large frequency. I wrap myself around and come back up the other way. And if this is a transfer function with real coefficients, which it will be for most of the systems we deal with, it turns out you get the mirror image of this curve. And so uh, this loop here uh, is very important because it turns out that you can show uh, that the stability of the system is related to the number of encirclements of the minus one point. So this little plus sign here is the minus one point. Uh, and in particular, uh, there's a theorem called the Nyquist theorem uh, that says if you look at the number of uh, right half plane poles of one plus LS, so this is if my system, oh sorry, so right half plane poles of a transfer function correspond to unstable modes, unstable eigenvalues of that system. All right, so I didn't say that. Um, and so if you look at the right half plane zeros of one plus LS, so if your process plant is, is stable, the dynamics of the system you're controlling is stable, and your controller is stable, this will be zero. Uh, and then what you can do is you can look at the number of right half plane poles of L of S. Uh, sorry, I did it wrong. This is the number of right half plane poles of L of S. You look at the number of clockwise encirclements, and this formula will hold. Uh, and so typically what we want is we want no right half plane poles of the closed loop because uh, this is going to occur in the denominator. And so if L of S has no right half plane poles, then I have to have no net encirclements. And so I can essentially get a graphical test of the system. So for example, in this particular system, if I had no right half plane poles in L of S, here I have a net encirclement of this point. So this is actually an unstable system. But you could see what would happen if I changed the gain overall. Suppose I just put a little k in front of c of s and I decrease the gain, right? Then this whole thing would shrink around the origin. The origin is sitting right here. And for, if I made the gain low enough, I would get rid of this encirclement, right? Eventually it would not encircle anymore. And so we can see that at low gain, this system might be stable, and at higher gain, it might be unstable. And so you can imagine how changing the gain might lead to instability, right, by looking at these Nyquist plots. Now, so the Nyquist plots give us a graphical technique for doing this. One of the reasons that they're very important is that you can graphically tell what the robustness is. So the distance, for example, from this curve to the minus one point tells me how much variation I can take in the process dynamics and still be stable. Right? So you can imagine if I choose a different process, this curve shifts a little bit, right? If, it's, if I don't have it quite right, so I can look at that. Um, but another thing is, from a design point of view, what we're plotting is L of S, right? And that's just P of S times C of S. And this is nice because, in fact, C of S is the thing that we're designing. 
Right? So if you were to look at the closed loop transfer function, you'd find out that C of s entered in a couple of different places, and it's very hard to reason if I change in this frequency range the controller response to this, how does that affect the overall stability? But in terms of L of s, it's just a multiplicative factor. And so for example, I might do something and say, well, I want to decrease the gain at this set of frequencies so that I don't come out quite as far and I come closer in right, and don't encircle the origin. So this is a technique called loop shaping. Uh, and loop shaping works because we can look at the open loop and reason about the closed loop, right? So that's sort of an important property because these closed loop systems are complicated, but the Nyquist criterion allows us to reason about the open loop, uh, to, uh, to design the open loop and reason about the closed loop. Okay, so that's the type of tool that's sitting there. And again, it's a frequency response based tool. So this is just the frequency response through the transfer function. Now, this sort of a representation and these sorts of tools enable all sorts of interesting things to occur. So one of them, for example, is that you can show that there are fundamental trade-offs. And so one question you might ask is, well, how well can I reject a disturbance? And so I might care, for example, about the effect of this disturbance, for example, on the size of the input. I don't want a disturbance to generate a very large input, right, because I don't want to amplify my disturbances somehow. And if you look at the transfer function between D and U, which tells you something about the overall uh, performance of the system in a certain way, or the transfer function between the reference and the error turns out to be the same. Um, that's a sensitivity, something called the sensitivity function, S of omega. And it's essentially a function that you can compute. And it turns out that the integral of the log of the sensitivity function must be positive. Now, this sensitivity function is telling you about the size of the disturbance attenuation. And so what you would like is that log, uh, sorry, that S of omega be very small, right? That a disturbance produce a very small input because it's compensating for it somehow. And if you want this to be small everywhere, right, that's not possible actually, because if this is less than one, then log of that is negative, And you know that the integral of this over all frequencies must be positive. So if it's negative someplace, it must be positive someplace else. The best you're going to get is that it's zero, right? And so that says that if there's some region in which I attenuate my disturbances, there must be some other region in which I amplify my disturbances, right? It's like conservation of energy. There's nothing free, right? So, and furthermore, if I want to attenuate my disturbances further, then some region has to get worse, right? Because if I make something more negative in some other region, right, this is a fundamental conserved quantity, it has to get more positive. Okay, so let me just show you that in the context of an example and see if I can kind of get that idea across. So this turns out to be a system that's just a magnetic levitation system. So think monorail at Disneyland or any of your favorite magnetic levitation systems. Um, in this particular case, there's an electromagnetic, there's an electromagnet, there's a sensor. The sensor senses the height of the ball. Um, and if it starts to fall, it turns the electromagnet on a little bit. If it starts to raise too much, it turns it down a little bit and you're trying to stabilize the position of this thing, right? So if you plot out the sensitivity function, so you look at how much I reject disturbances, here's a plot of what that uh, disturbance function looks like. Um, this is the sensitivity function written in dB, so uh, minus 20 dB would be a factor of 10, right? So if I put in a disturbance of a certain size, right, I will get uh, whatever square root of 10 is uh, worth of uh, output. And I say, you know, that's a little bit much, right? I'd like that if I apply forces to this, I don't get as much error, right, uh, in what's going on. And so can I make it smaller? So if you try and make it smaller, and notice here, right, that while some of it is less than one, the log of one is zero, while some of it is less than one, some of it must be greater than one. But since this integral is conserved, and in this case it turns out that it must be equal to a positive number that we can compute, so if I push down and try and get better disturbance rejection in the low frequency range, right, then it has to go up someplace. And so a standard control design might push it down here, but it's going to go up here. Now, these two are balancing. Notice that here I'm on a log scale. So it looks like I got a lot better here, right, for a little bit here. But remember, the distance between this point and this point is, right, a factor is between 100 and 1,000, right, whereas this is between 0 and 100, right? So that's why they look a little bit skewed because of the plotting. And now all of a sudden I'm getting at least a factor of 10, maybe a factor of square root of 3 times 10 improvement at low frequency. Suppose I say, look, I want 1% error, right? I don't want any more than 1% error uh, in this system. So I want to push it down below minus 40, right? That would be 1% error, minus 40 dB. So I'm going to really push it down. And I can do that. But when I do that, at certain frequencies, right, I'm going to be able to put a disturbance in at that frequency and really shake this system around, right? So I'm creating a resonance. You might say, <coughs> gee, that's a bad control design, right? You should be able to fix that. No, you can't, right? There's a fundamental trade-off between your ability to reject noise and uncertainty, right, and the performance that you want. So there's a trade-off between performance uh, and uncertainty in this context, and you cannot get rid of that. It's a conserved quantity, essentially. So that's the way you should think about it. Okay, so 
How do you fix it? Well, you basically have to redesign the system, right? Pick some different actuator, pick some different sensor, right? I mean, for this system, there's nothing you can do. So this spacecraft, if that's what it was, simply is not going to be able to land within one meter of its target site. Sorry, no way, right? That's it. Redesign it, right? Put new actuators on, do something different. Okay, so that's sort of an example, of, again, the type of trade-off that people in control theory look at. Okay, so just as a kind of uh, summary of where, I'll call it traditional control with apologies to John, <coughs> because he's one of the people who developed this picture and he would certainly not call it quite classical control or traditional control. Um, but here's the sort of thing that one can do in this framework. So suppose I have some process, um, I have some disturbance that comes in, I'm just redrawing uh, my kind of uh, design pattern. Um, here's my controller around here. Uh, and I have some output that I care to regulate, right? So this may be the error between the reference and the input, for example. And this is a weighting function. It's a frequency-based weighting function that tells me over what frequency range do I care about this, right? I mean, the reality is that typically we only want good tracking up to some frequency of my inputs, right? It's ridiculous to say I want my spacecraft to be able to track a reference signal uh, at uh, gigahertz, right? Because it's not going to be able to do that, right? So we have to decide where we want it. And the other thing that's here that's interesting that I haven't talked about yet is this loop up at the top. And this is actually model uncertainty. So I'm going to model the fact that I don't know exactly what the dynamics of this process are. And furthermore, it may not just be disturbances, which are sitting here anyway, or parametric, unmodeled, uh, uh, parametric uncertainties. I may actually have some dynamics that I didn't know about, right? So if I'm you know, designing control off for an airplane, the fact of the matter is that the wings are slightly flexible, and that may matter. If I'm designing the cruise controller for Mitch's car, it depends what tire he's got on there, right? And you know, if I'm doing, let's say, not cruise control, but steering control, right, the dynamics of that tire might matter. And I'd like to make sure that you know, when Mitch changes the tires and puts a little bit different steering dynamics in there, that the thing doesn't go unstable. So one thing I could do is I could try and say, well, in some frequency range, I know less about the system than in other frequency ranges. And this is actually an uncertainty block uh, that is an input-output model itself. That is, it's not parametric uncertainty. It's actual dynamical system that has its own input-output properties. And so the way you should think about this picture is, suppose that I would like to design a system in which the gain between a disturbance, written here in terms of the L2 norm, so the integral of the energy uh, over time, is uh, upper is an upper bound, according to gamma, for the output measure that I care about. That is, that whatever this output measure is, I want it to be gamma less than, multiplicatively less than, whatever my disturbance is. So bigger disturbances will lead to bigger outputs, but if this is 0.01, right, that might be a 1% error, for example. And now I'd like to do that for any unmodeled dynamics, not even knowing what they are, just knowing that they are bounded somehow. So here, sort of written as bounded by 1. Then this turns out to be a problem that robust control theory solves, right? That is, find, synthesize a controller that satisfies this specification. And that specification will work. It will be resilient, if you will, to use the term of the day, uh, to any change in your system that happens to fit within this bound. For example, if you said, I've got redundant actuators, and I can guarantee you that no matter which actuator fails, if only one fails, that the effect on the process dynamics can be captured in this way, right? Then this will be robust with respect to that actuator failure. Right? That is, I will get my performance specification and stability, so stability is built in uh, for that. So this allows us to say, can I get X level of uncertainty performance even with Y, uh, X level of performance even with Y level of uncertainty? Right? Or to say, no, that's not possible. That trade-off doesn't work. Right? So in the previous example that I gave you, you could ask for specifications that are not realizable. Right? That is, and it would come back and say, sorry, that's not possible, and it simply won't be. Okay, so there are lots of generalizations to this, but it's sort of an example of the sorts of things that can be done. Okay, so that's sort of, if you want, this up to here is uh, 10 weeks of Control Theory 101 uh, in 41 minutes and 19 seconds, okay? Uh, and so, right, that's sort of what we teach uh, in the class uh, on Control Theory is, you know, more or less up through this point, right? And we teach them how to design things and how to get things to work and stuff. So that's the type of Control Theory that, you know, even in the 80s, in the 90s, you know, this is the sort of things that people are doing. Well, what have people been doing more recently, right? You know, where are things headed? What, what could control theory offer? You know, this is all very much, you know, uh, dynamical systems, and I'm controlling attitude or velocities or things, right? It's not I'm controlling mission phases or I'm trying to deploy, right, you know, a certain instrument and what happens if that deploy, you know, it's not at that logical level, right? So how do we start moving up that chain a little bit? Okay, so to start down that process, let's look a little bit more uh, at this problem of feed forward. And I showed you this design pattern. Uh, and this trajectory generation piece turns out to be pretty important. I haven't used it so far, but remember I sort of showed you this example 
uh, of this ducted fan flying around. And what I told you was going on was that I have some system. And what I'm actually doing is I'm calculating a trajectory. So suppose I tell you, look, I'd like you to be on the other side of the room. Right? What I'm going to do is I know the dynamics of the system, the nominal dynamics. I'm going to calculate out a trajectory for those nominal dynamics. That trajectory is going to satisfy the constraints on the system. I've got a ducted fan engine here. I've got ceiling right, and floor. I can only move my actuators at a certain rate. Subject to all of those constraints, I'm going to calculate how to get from here to the other side of the room. I'm going to implement that for a tenth of a second. Right? Now, my model wasn't perfect. I had disturbances there. I'm not going to be at exactly the point that I thought I was. I'm going to be slightly different. So from where I am now, I'm going to recompute what I should do. Right? And I'm going to go that for a tenth of a second. I'm going to recompute, recompute, recompute. Right? Every tenth of a second, I'm going to recompute what to do and compensate for any disturbances or errors or process uncertainty that came up. And when you do that, that's sort of what this trajectory that's actually flying around is doing. That is that we told it move not to the other side of the room, but right to there. Uh, and then I think we actually do tell it to move to the other side of the room. And what's happening in the computation that you can't see is that we are constantly recomputing this trajectory, recomputing this trajectory, recomputing this trajectory. Now, at the time we did this, about 10 years ago, uh, that required, I don't know, probably $20,000 worth of computing, right, and a bunch of digital signal processes and everything else, and it was less powerful than my $1,000 MacBook sitting in front of me, right? And so, you know, this is just one of those places where computation has made this be the de facto thing that we would do. If you have a nonlinear system with constraints, you can use this sort of a technique. And so this is what we call optimization-based control, and it kind of generalizes uh, this notion. And it tells you where this dashed line comes from, right? It's because I actually use my current state to recompute the trajectory over and over and over again, right? So I'm putting another feedback loop in my system. So uh, this is uh, the same picture, right? So here is this sort of feedback loop coming back. This is receding horizon control. That is, I generate my trajectory. And so suppose that what I do is that I calculate out <clears throat> what I'd like to do for the next capital T seconds. And I get this red curve here that says this is what I compute my state will be. I then implement that for some short period of time, delta T. And I don't get exactly that curve. I get this blue curve because my process wasn't right or I had disturbances or other things. I then, at this point, recompute, right? So I recompute another red curve and I implement that, right? I go forward another delta T seconds. I don't end up exactly where I was. So I recompute another curve, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the computation that we're doing is actually minimizing. So compute over some uh, time period, delta T, uh, sorry, capital T, m find an input U of T that minimizes some cost function here, the integral of this cost plus some terminal cost. Right? And this says, I want you to follow the trajectory and stay as far away from constraints as you can at the end of the trajectory, for example. So we might do that. Um, and we would do that with potentially nonlinear dynamics as well as state and input constraints. And again, in the last decade or two, this is the sort of thing that you can just implement on your computer very quickly. And so we do that, right? We just constantly recompute what's going on. And so this sort of a technique, then, if you, there's still stability issues, and you have to be careful that you take, you're doing a short-term optimization for a potentially long-term stability goal, and so that's what this terminal cost is. So there are lots of little details. But the fact of the matter is that it works very well. And it has a very interesting property, that is that to some extent, you can think about when we design a control law, we say ahead of time, whatever your current state and reference are, I want to pre-compute via my control law what the input's going to be. Here what I do is I don't pre-compute it, I online compute it, right? Given the current state, and this is sort of the cost function that I want, I want you to compute right now what's going on. So we essentially take what used to be an offline design and analysis and do an online design. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because what happens if an actuator fails? If an actuator fails, f of x changes. So what? Use that f of x. That is, if I know that the actuator failed and I have less actuation authority, I can still minimize this cost function with whatever controls I have. Right? What happens if my process dynamics change? If I can measure that process dynamics, right, I can do that. What happens if I can measure the disturbances? I can actually put the disturbances in this as well. So it allows us to adapt in a much smarter way to at least model-based changes that occur. Right? So I'm still using, this is an offline optimization, it's using some model, right? If my constraints change, you know, all of a sudden you're in a mission phase where I don't want you to, you know, apply thrust outside of this range or something like that, fine. Put that in as a constraint, right? But you have to have something that you can specify in terms of uh, f of x and a g of x and things like that, right? If all of a sudden some complicated gear thing got screwed up and now when I move my actuator, I command my actuator to go this way, it goes in the opposite direction, okay, can't handle that, right? It's not that resilient. Right? But if you just say that actuator's failed, I'm going to lock it out because it did the wrong thing, I can just continuously uh, adapt. So um, 
it's a very interesting approach to doing things when you have nonlinearities and actuator constraints, and you come to me and you say, how should we do this? I say, start with the receding horizon control and tell me why that won't work. Right? If you tell me why it won't work, right, then fine. Maybe there's something different you should do. But for the most part, this is a viable thing. And it used to be they would say, I can't compute fast enough. Right? And I say, really? That's funny. I don't think that's true. Right? Uh, and so now I'm um, increasingly right. <laughs> and so they're putting this on jet engines. They're putting this in aircraft. Right? I mean, things that you wouldn't expect. People are starting to work through the certification issues. You should be thinking there's an underlying optimization going on. How do you know how many cycles it takes to converge? Those things are being worked out. Right? So this is just a technique that exists, and we should use it. OK. So that's one thing that's changed. Now, you know, as we really look towards the types of things we're talking about in this workshop, um, I think we have to think more broadly, certainly, than this. It's a tool from control theory that's existed for the past 20 years or so, and in the last 10 has become very refined and applied to aerospace systems. But you know, the way I now, and this is a chart that I use in courses that we teach now, sort of graduate courses, you know, what does a control system look like these days? And we call this a network control system. You still have the process, the sensing, and the actuation, and the external environment. I showed you all of those before. Um, and in the design pattern that I showed you, we would say, OK, you got some sort of state estimation. You take that state estimation, you use it for online optimization, trajectory generation, and then you wrap some internal feedback controller around it to handle the faster time scales. Faster than a tenth of a second needs to be handled by something else. right? So this is exactly the same design pattern I showed you, just drawn uh, in a slightly different layout. But now we want to start putting in the parts that come up. So one that you already heard this morning from Bob is fault tolerance, right? What happens when a fault occurs, right? So now we have to manage those faults. So we have to both detect that a fault occurred, manage that fault occurring. Um, and so somehow in here, right, I might do that. And as the picture gets uh, clearer, we'll sort of show more complicated ways to do it. But imagine for now, I just, if a fault occurs, I can at least command you to go to a safe position, right? So that might be the type of thing that's coming here. So I start ignoring this trajectory or something like that. Um, another thing that's uh, increasingly occurring is that the sensing that we use is not just a single sensor like speed but uh, cameras and laser range finders and all sorts of stuff around us. We have lots and lots of sensors. And as you have lots and lots of sensors, you have lots and lots of state estimation. Uh, and those state estimations, in fact, may be part of the way you're doing your mode management. Some of them may be feeding your optimization, other things. Um, all of those state estimations may force you into a hierarchical structure for your controller. I have a high level and a medium level and a low level controller because I'm trying to reason about how to drive or how to fly in some complicated environment. And so now we have right, sort of multiple uh, online optimization trajectory generations, maybe at different levels. Um, and as you start doing all of that, you start using more and more computers. Right? This doesn't run on my MacBook anymore. It runs on five MacBooks or 10 MacBooks worth of computing power. But as soon as it's on more than one MacBook's worth of computing power, then you have synchronization issues. So the little clock here, right? Now, this came up this morning, right? Oh, now all of these things might be slightly out of sync or not, right? depending on how I architect it. And so do I need them to be synchronized, or do I not need them to be synchronized? The other thing is that I already alluded to is that increasingly we have an online model of what's going on. That online model might be getting fed by the fault management and being used to detect faults. But once I detect those faults, I can update my online optimization and also use it for my state estimation. You know, hey, I know there's a fault, so now I need to change the model I use for state estimation because I need to know uh, something about what's happening and I want to do my online optimization differently. And so all of that now becomes the control design problem, if you will. And this is now what I would call the low-level control design problem, where control theory tools apply. And then on top of that, we want to do things like goal management. So we did a little bit of work uh, with the mission data system, so MDS. Um, attention and awareness, right? Machine learning types of ideas, right? You know, how, how do you do all of these things, too? These are all, it's still a feedback control system in some sense. These are just higher level functions that we need to think about. And finally, in many applications, it's not one system that looks like this, but a whole set of systems that look like this, all talking to each other across the network. Right? So this is the real control design problem that we want to look at, right, in terms of what we're doing. And so I think that's where a lot of control theory is going, is into you know, thinking about different pieces of these things. And increasingly, and I'll tell you a little bit about it, these guys are not things that are just low-level, continuous position and velocity types of uh, reasoning, but also decision-making. Stop, go, uh, do this part of the mission, do that part of the mission. And so how do we uh, sort of do all of that at once and interacting with things like the sets of goals you want to currently do? So an example that we did uh, jointly with uh, people at JPL was the DARPA Grand Challenge. So this was a project uh, that was looking at designing autonomous vehicles with lots of sensing systems that could sense around them. This is a sort of a view of the different software blocks that we had that we're putting together. So to Bob's point, this is not an architecture, but rather just a description of the software that we were running. I'll show you a little bit more of an architectural view 
uh, in a second. And this system was able to do pretty interesting things. So it could drive along, it could stop at stop lines, it could check to make sure no traffic was coming, it could decide to turn, it could drive down a road. There's no lane lines here, or there are, but they're pretty faint. It has to figure out where they are, it has to figure out that it can go around uh, vehicles. If it sees things that are blocking the road, it has to stop and think about that. Okay, can I fit between those things? Yeah, I guess I can. Okay, let's drive down there. This is completely autonomous, nobody in the car. This is from the 2007 uh, Urban Challenge. Uh, here it's stopping, as it reasons about this, it decides it has to change lanes, so it actually signals, changes lanes, and then comes back into the original lane. Um, other places, it decides that there's enough clearance that it doesn't necessarily have to change lanes. Uh, and so this system, as you can imagine, it's a feedback control system, right? Uh, but it's making a lot of decisions that are not just proportional, integral, and derivative feedback, right, somehow, right? I mean, this is having to decide to change lanes, stop, turn on the signals, uh, wait, look, is there an opening, all of those sorts of things. So when we designed this system, very much working with Bob and others at JPL, uh, we thought about what the architecture should be for this. Uh, and so this is now a view where we thought about having, uh, this is more of a functional decomposition of what's going on. So we had lots of different sensing functions that were connected through a sort of integrated bus uh, that allowed any, uh, th to a set of uh, feature detection uh, uh, functions that allowed us to combine different sensors to detect different features. That all went into some sort of a representational map of the world around us on which we could reason, and we could reason at different levels. And the navigation system became a navigation stack. Uh, and so we had high level mission planning. You know, I can go down, if I, I need to get to City Hall, so should I go down Lake Street or Hill Street? You know, which way should I go? Um, we had a traffic planner that said, okay, I'm on Hill Street. It's two lanes in each direction. There's a car in front of me slow. Should I change lanes or not change lanes? Then we had the path planner. Okay, now I need to change lanes, right? We don't, I want to minimize the distance between me and the center of the road, but not apply too much input power, right? So it looks like one of those online optimization problems. Uh, and then we get down to the kind of classical control system sitting down here. So again, you see this design pattern sort of reflecting itself, but now these upper level functions are also there, right? And here, you know, in the way that we thought about this, there were a set of concepts and principles to this that defined the way that this architecture came together. And so we thought a lot about, you know, how can we do this in a way where we'd say, no, you're not allowed to do that because it's not consistent with the design patterns that we've chosen to implement in this system. And what are the interfaces between these? And, and it worked out in many ways great. We, uh, there were lots of bugs and other things uh, that kept us from going and winning the competition. But I think from the point of view of saying this is a, systematic architecture that we, the team, felt was elegant and principled, uh, we were very happy with it as a first cut. And I just wanted to say just a little bit in the last couple of minutes about this right-hand side. Um, this is an architectural element which we think of as a planning hourglass. What happened here is we thought of everything in terms of trajectory. So the goal was to get a trajectory that we could tell the path planner to follow that satisfied the constraints. And everything above that was in a hierarchical fashion generating this trajectory. And everything below that was following that trajectory. And I could change out the whole bottom of this and not have to change the top of this. And same thing, vice versa. And the same was true at each of these levels. And so we could change in different mission planners or other things in a very modular way. And in principle, you could actually do that at race time, right? You could say, aha, this is what we're seeing out there. So let's go put in the traffic planner that's optimized to that situation. And because we've done it in this modular way and it takes the right inputs and outputs, right, it can do that and just be used, right? So in that sense, perhaps. And furthermore, we actually had multiple things, that could, various ones of these, we had multiple things that could run, and we would flip them in and out depending on if a failure occurred. So a little bit, uh, we had process migration, so a little bit like the sorts of things you're seeing. If a computer went down, we'd migrate things to another processor, restart. We weren't as sophisticated about thinking about the decomposition of function and state, uh, so that uh, causes some challenges. But nonetheless, right, it was designed to allow processor failure, sensor failure, Actuator failure, most of the actuator failure said stop, because if you don't have steering, then you should stop. Um, but nonetheless, it had all of those sorts of features. So it was very interesting uh, system to design. Um, it was also incredibly frustrating, because each of these blocks was a group of people who were doing the design, and then when we put the system together, we had to check to make sure it worked, and make sure all of our assumptions about how things were going to happen were right. And where we found failures, both in the field and in the competition, was in fact uh, in places that we had made a bad assumption or the assumptions were different at this level than this level, and those assumptions then caused the system to uh, not operate correctly. Uh, and, you know, sort of too late, you're in the race, you can't do anything about it at that point. And so designing these systems turned out to be very difficult, and what was frustrating about it was that it was a bunch of humans doing the best they could to design things with their understanding of the problem, and then if we were lucky, we could test the system like crazy and see whether or not something came up that was a flaw, and then say, oh, that's not supposed to happen. Let's go back and redesign the system. 
And so one of the things that we and a lot of others in the field have been doing is to try and get a little bit better about that synthesis. I told you one of the nice things about control theory is that for the most part, we just tell the computer to solve the problem. We give it the spec, it might be that cost function, we give it the model, right, x dot equals f of x u, g of x u is less than or equal to zero, and then we say synthesize an open loop trajectory that does this via an optimization, or synthesize a PID controller that satisfies these specs. Can we do that at some of these higher levels of abstraction? These are decision-making systems, right? Turn left or right, go downhill, go down uh, some different street, there's a car in front of you, do I stop or do I go around it, right? How do I react to my environment in a discrete way? And so one of the things we've been looking at, and when uh, Mumu and Nejmeh talk, you'll hear a little bit about this, uh, is using formal methods for both system verification, but increasingly for system synthesis. That is, if you think about having a set of requirements and assumptions and some formal specifications, and so someone gives you a design uh, and, and a system, and so with that system design, you can then try and verify, does this system satisfy these formal specifications? That's one way of doing it. But another way to do it is say, I'll give you a description of the system, I'll give you the specs, and you synthesize right, some sort of decision-making engine that automatically, correct by construction, satisfies the specification. Can we do that? Does that make sense? These are reactive protocols. That is, uh, you get to an intersection, depending on what you see, you have to decide what to do. Right? You're sensing, you're actuating, you're computing. Right? And so how do we do that sort of logic synthesis, if you will, for a hybrid dynamical system right, that has both the underlying physics as well as uh, the decision-making in the software? And so there are some techniques uh, for doing that, uh, and if you're interested, you can talk to me about it. Uh, again, you'll hear a little bit about it on Wednesday afternoon, for those of you uh, in the workshop. Um, but if you're interested, uh, I'll tell you. Okay, so uh, that's sort of what I wanted to tell you. So what I hope you will remember is that there are a couple of main principles of feedback control theory. One is feedback is a tool for providing robustness to uncertainty. Uncertainty can mean noise, disturbances, unmodeled dynamics. Um, Another is that feedback, feedback is a tool to design the dynamics of a system, right, to have whatever performance properties you want. And combine these principles enable often or are part of thinking about modularity and hierarchy, right? You put feedback loops around the controller uh, so that at some level I know I'm going to follow that trajectory within 0.1 meters and I don't have to worry about it anymore, right? It's going to do that independent of what's below it or what's above it, right? Uh, and so I, I can use that both above and below uh, in my design. Okay, where's the field heading? Well, as I told you, you know, originally the tools were developed really to design fairly low-level control systems, flight controllers and other sorts of things. Increasingly, we're applying these to more complicated systems, networked and hybrid control systems. Uh, and one thing I think is how do we do systematic design of the architectures and the control protocols within the different layers, right? So I talked to you a little about you know, the notion that we're thinking about control protocols. That's sort of once a, a decomposition, a layering has been determined, then we can start talking about that. But you can also say, could I synthesize what the right architecture is, where the layer should be and what the interfaces should be, or otherwise more formally think about it. Say, if I want a certain resiliency, whatever we define that to be, to certain classes of things. Okay, so if you're interested in more information, because now in the last 20 minutes, I covered a short course that was 21 hours long, plus a whole another 10 weeks of class uh, on the second course. So I'm sure you got it all, uh, but just in case, there are a couple of references that you can look. So one is, for the very first set of material, classical control theory, um, there's a book uh, that I wrote with Carl Astrom. Um, I put this up here shamelessly because it's free as a download, as a PDF, so you're welcome to download it for free. Um, and uh, you can also buy it in hardback if you want, but uh, it's cheap. Uh, but Free is really cheap. Uh, and so this has, you know, Nyquist curves and frequency response and, right, you know, disturbance rejection and all of those things, right? So you're welcome to take a look at that if you'd like to learn a little bit more. As the title indicates, it was written as an introduction for scientists and engineers, right? So it's not intended for, you're an air, hardcore aerospace engineer who knows exactly what you want to do, but you might be a biologist or applied physicist, right, or somebody else. Uh, it's intended for that group. Um, the optimization-based control is also something that we teach a course on. It's not yet in textbook form, uh, but there is, if you go to the feedback systems page, you'll see a supplement called optimization-based control, uh, and you can download that supplement, um, and that supplement has all the things I talked about in receding horizon control and what the various tricks are and how to do that and proofs of stability and other things, uh, and so that's there as well. Uh, and lastly, on these kind of network control systems and all of these protocols and other things, we do teach a 21-hour short course on this, and that's also up on the web, uh, and so you're welcome to download that. Um, you, you know, this is in book form, uh, this is in notes form, uh, this is in PowerPoint form, uh, meaning that, you know, it's a bunch of lectures, right, and then a bunch of references to papers, right? So you're seeing this, the progression, the usual progression of uh, uh, providing things. Uh, and as soon as I get a chance, during Brian's talk probably, uh, I'll put up the references on the uh, workshop wiki so that you can just click on them uh, and get there. And if people ask me about stuff, uh, I'll also put those references up there. So uh, with that, this thing says that I have uh, I'm 12 seconds over, so I'll stop there.